Welcome to Bio 110. This is going to be the second lecture about microscopy. Today we're going to be covering uh, the topics of electron microscopy and confocal microscopy. So let's begin by looking at electron microscopy. Electron microscopy uses a beam of electrons instead of a light beam as a sort of illumination to visualize the cell sample. In that way, achieving greater resolution than light microscopy. However, in order to perform electron microscopy, you require extensive manipulation of the sample. The first part of that manipulation requires fixation. Fixation, it's going to kill the sample, uh, but it's going to allow the components within the cell to remain complete and in place. That will then ensure the appropriate imaging with the electron microscope. The second part that is required for electron microscopy is going to be the dehydration. All water must be removed from the sample before performing electron microscopy. And this is done using a critical point dryer. Last, you have to perform coating of the experiment with metal, in particular a gold spray. So the gold spray is placed on the specimen and that is going to allow an enhancement of the electron generation when the electron beam hits the gold atoms. When the electron beams hit the specimen, the excitation of those gold atoms is going to create secondary electrons which are also going to be detected to form the image. Let's take a moment to look at the structure of the electron microscope. The electron microscope has many of the components that are shared with the light microscopes. It has an electron gun, which is going to generate the electrons for illumination. Since electrons cannot travel in air, all the electrons and the components of the electron microscope will be found in a vacuum, which is not shown in this image. The next component is going to be a condenser lens. Just like in light microscopy, the condenser lens is going to help focus the beam in the microscope. Next, we're going to see a, def a beam deflector. The beam deflector is going to be controlled by a scan generator and that is going to allow the beam of electron to be moved over the sample, allowing for the scanning of the sample um, to be performed. Last but not least, what you have is an objective lens which is going to be able to um, help visualize the magnification of the sample. What you can see is that the electrons are going to be moving onto the sample and electrons are going to bounce off of the sample generating electrons from the specimen. Those could then be detected at an angle as the by uh, the detector, and then the detector is connected to a video screen to show the image. Since the electron beam is scanning the sample, you are having a constant shower of electrons over the sample. The sample then generates secondary electrons that are going to be um, scattered uh, to the side, and those could then be gen de detected excuse me, by the detector. And that is how scanning electron microscopy allows you to work. What you get are beautiful images. Here in the left we have a developing wheat flower has been visualized by scanning electron microscopy. Notice over here you have some areas that are very dark and some areas that are very light. So the scanning electron microscope will allow you to visualize biological surfaces and structures, but only the structures and that are present at the surface of the sample. It has great resolution to a limit of about 10 nanometers in uh, length, so it's able to tell apart two spheres, which are 10 nanometers apart from one another, which is a great improvement from the 200 nanometers that is the resolution of the light microscope. So when you look at the image in the left, you can see some areas that are dark. Those dark areas result from stained metal-coated areas 
that are dark because the metal scatters the electrons away from the detector, generating the shadows that give you a more rich three-dimensional uh, image of what the structures are. In that regard, the scanning electron microscope is a perfect uh, instrument when you are interested about knowing information um, based on the surface of your sample. Next, we're going to look about the transmission electron microscope. Take a look at the previous image so you can compare the uh, lenses and the organization of the scope between the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope. Again, both of them have a electron gun. That electron gun is going to generate the electrons that are going to be showered into the sample. Now you have a condenser lens and that condenser lens it's going to focus the, uh, the electrons on the specimen shown here in a grid. After that you have the objective lens and in this case a projector lens which is similar to the eyepiece that then allows for the visualization of the sample. So notice that in transmission electron microscope what you're hoping to see are the electrons which are transmitted through the sample not only the electrons that are being scattered from the surface of the sample. So that is a big difference between scanning and transmission electron microscopy. However, um, in order to achieve penetrance of the electron beam, you have to prepare the sample. And one of the most important aspects for sample preparation is sectioning. In a cryostat, an instrument that allows us to cut the sample, you can find, as shown here on the left, a sample that you have embedded in some kind of resin. It could be parafilm or it could be another kind of resin that is going to keep the sample nicely um, positioned in place. That specimen block is then um, maintained into a specimen holder and the specimen holder it's uh, attached to a lever that is going to permit the you to raise or lower the specimen holder shown over here in the left by manipulating the lever. Now at the bottom is a very sharp knife that is designed to uh, shave off um, pieces of the sample from the, sam the specimen block. As you can see on the right uh, you can determine the thickness of the sections that you want to do and traditionally for transmission electron microscopy we use them between 50 nanometers to 100 nanometers thick. Imagine a cell that is 10 micrometers in diameter therefore you can cut multiple slides of that cell that are going to be embedded in the parafilm. So this kind of technique could be used then to generate these slivers of specimen containing the specimen block and you can put them either on a microscope slide if you're wanting to do histology through conventional microscopy or you can put them in a copper mesh grid for electron transmittance electron microscopy. But the sectioning is what's going to generate the sample. The other interesting thing that you can do is that since you're generating sequential samples, you can have the samples aligned so you can then follow the sequence from the top of the cell to the bottom of the cell. At the end, you will obtain an image such as this. What we have in here are organelles within a cell that has been visualized by transmission electron microscopy. As you can see, with transmission electron microscopy, you get much greater resolution. Instead, um, what we have resolution is 0.1 nanometers uh, in distance, which is 2,000 fold better than the light microscope. 10, micro 10 nanometers is the resolution of the scanning electron microscope. So it's even better. So this will give you about 1 million fold magnification. So now look over here at the scale. So we have a 10 micrometer scale and you can appreciate organelles inside the cell like the nucleus, the nucleolus, ribosomes, the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria. 
So you can get with transmission electron microscopy a much better resolution of ultra structures within a cell. So now, what are the pros and cons of electron microscopy? The pros are resolution. The resolution of electron microscopy is very much improved compared to light microscopy. Remember, light microscopy is 200 nanometers. Scanning electron microscopy is 10 nanometers and transmittance electron microscopy is only 0.1 nanometers. So, increased resolution. However, that comes at the cost of losing your sample because the sample has to be fixed and prepared and that will not allow it to live. So the sample will die during the fixation and preparation steps. Since we have to cover the sample with a thin layer of gold particles that could also introduce dark areas that could generate artifacts. So making sure that you have repetitive samples for scanning and imaging will ensure that you get proper data from a macros uh, electron microscopy sample. So what is the future our microscopy holds? Well, the future of microscopy is very interesting because with the advances in optics, computer, and engineering, we can now visualize proteins interacting with one another in the cell in real time. So we can look at images with FRET or with FRAP, and I can actually go with you over this in, um, in the lecture tomorrow. The other thing that is very interesting is the potential generation of fluorescent sensors that can detect changes in specific molecules within the cell or can check when the cell is moving. So if you have a fluorescent sensor that will um, emit fluorescence when you have an increase in calcium um, intracellularly and only when calcium has gone apart beyond a particular threshold, then you can generate images live within cells as the event of calcium uptake, for example, is being measured in real time. The other interesting future in microscopy it's the idea of high-resolution three-dimensional models of molecules or cells. And here, what I'm going to do in the next uh, several slides, I'm going to show you the visualization of development cells in three dimensions and in real time. This is an example from a paper from a Dr. Uh, Ellen Robbie at the University of California in Berkeley where Professor Manila did her postdoc, and they're using a special type of confocal microscope called a two-photon microscope to visualize cells within the thymus. So now what we have here, it's an image from the paper published in PLOS Biology. Uh, and this paper, what is addressing, it's the tracking of how T lymphocytes developing within the thymus migrate. Since the thymus is an internal organ, uh, it is very difficult to see how the cells that are being generated in the thymus are traveling within the organ. Are they traveling at all? Do they get specific cues? Are they staying static? So in order to check this, what they generated was a mouse in which all T cells will be fluorescent green by the expression of the green fluorescent protein. Since the T cells are the only cells that fluoresce green, then they will be able to uh, image the thymus of the animals, the intact tissue without having to destroy it, and visualize how the cells are moving within a three-dimensional space in that organ. So they're able to take uh, measurements in the X, Y, and Z. The Z will be what we call the Z stack, so the thickness of the sample. X will be one parameter and Y will be the other, so it will be about the same. But the Z parameter shows you the three-dimensionality of the tissue. And later, with computer software, they're able then to track each cells and generate a pathway. So here in this movie, I'm going to start playing it for you, what you're seeing are 
the dimensional image of GFP expressing thymocytes within an intact thymic lobe of a mouse. So what they have done is to set the microscope, the, um, the special confocal microscope, the two photon microscope, set it up, focus the image to where they found the thymocytes, and then determine that they wanted to take an image um, um, in the thymus in a thickness of 40 micrometers. So that could have been um, the, the visual range of the microscope, uh, the visual um, scope of the area is 164 micrometers by 164 micrometers. So that will be the X and the Y. Now the Z stack, it's the area um, that they now have taken an image every micrometer for 40 micrometers. So showing all the thymocytes that are present within a 40 micrometer slide of the thymus. So they set up their instrument so their image will begin approximately 140 micrometers below the capsule of the thymus and then move up and forward. So what you can see now is the image of all the thymocytes three-dimensionally. Where are they located um, in this particular point of time? As you can see, the sample is rotating around and you can see that some of the thymuses, um, the thymocytes, excuse me, are located above others. So they are at different locations in the thymic slice. Some of them are closer to the bottom, other ones are closer to the top, some are present in the middle. So again, I'll do it one more time, so you can appreciate the image as it's rotating, and you can see that within a 40 micrometer uh, slice of the thymus, you have many thymocytes, shown here in green, that are now present in the sample. So the next thing to do is to repeat this image, taking um, in the C stack, but do it over time. So now you will take those 40 images, um, so the, um, the microscope will be able to move the focus of the lens uh, from the bottom of the Z stack to the top of the Z stack, that is 40 micrometers, and take the image so you can get a block like the one that we just saw, but then now do it with a time issue. So here, um, you can then generate a movie. So the movie is generated from 20 to 33 minutes of imaging that are repeated and played at 6 frames per second. So you take a sample, you let the sample um, be imaged for between 20 and 33 minutes, and then you allow the C stacks to be put together into a movie, and the movie will be generated by the computer. So what you can see is remarkable. What you can see now is the position of the thymocytes as they are moving within the thymus. So as the thymocytes move, some of them are moving laterally, other ones are being very speedy and crossing completely across the sample, um, across the sample and disappearing out of the stack, so they're going probably deeper than what the computer was set to do and other ones are moving within the region. Other ones seem to be quite stationary. And at this point, we hypothesize that they may be have been interacting with other cells that are present in the thymus, but are not being visualized because they do not have fluorescence. So what you can see, one more time, you'll go ahead and pick up your favorite thymocyte and follow it along. Some of them move very well across the... Um, visual field of the microscope, and others tend to move in and out of the field. One more time for the movie. At the end, what you get is that with the computer you can track the thymocytes and ask the computer, you know what, here's a thymocyte, tell me where this thymocyte is moving with time. And you generate then a four-dimensional tracking the fourth dimension being time, within the two-dimensional structure of the thymus. So you assign um, thymocytes to be a ball, 
and the computer will follow the movement in the movie of that thymocyte and give you the path that that thymocyte is traveling within the sample. So let's see the movies. So as you see, the lens of some of those paths are it's very small. The lens of some of the other paths it's very complicated and long. So what is driving the movement of those thymocytes about? It's very interesting. So to follow the tracking of the thymocytes, what the scientist has done is to use a color code. So at the beginning of the image, the track will be blue, and at the end of the image, the track will be yellow. So if you follow a track in particular, you can then see from the beginning of the track to the end of the track. Some of these thymocytes are moving very nicely well. This, this one here in the lower left that moves, comes down, and then it seems to move inside the same sample in a zigzag fashion. I'll show you to you later. Let's do it again. Other ones tend to come from the back of the sample to the top of the sample. So this kind of image will allow you then to establish that the possibly selected thymocytes are moving in real time, that their biology is being affected by the interactions that they're having in the thymus, and that they're not stuck in place um, waiting for things to happen. They're actually moving about, getting signals, interacting with other cells or with other thymocytes. So now for more information, uh, please go to the Biology Project website here at uh, www.biology.arizona.edu forward slash cell underscore bio forward slash tutorials forward slash cells forward slash cells dot html. That will give you the information uh, to supplement some of the images that you have seen. Well, thank you. Hopefully this will be useful for you and I'll see you tomorrow in class.